I'm absolutely delighted to invite Gianna Moscardo to deliver our final keynote address under the overall theme, today's theme, of value-based interpretation in tourism. I think that needs a little explanation, and I'm going to leave Jana to explain it. More meaningful experiences make visitors and local people more mindful towards our common future. How do we create conditions for a meaningful experience? Jana, we look to you to help us answer some of these questions. Jana's impressive biography is on the website for all to see, and she herself is part, clearly part of the human heritage of Australia, that great mix of people from all over the world who are or are descended from immigrants and who in many cases, and I remember this from my own visit, have built up their own vibrant ethnic communities with their own tales to tell. I repeat, people are heritage, heritage is people. Jana's most recent work has been on using stories for designing tourist experiences and for improving tourism sustainability. And that, I applaud that. Stories, Jana says, are an essential part of being human. They are critical to how we learn about, understand and act in the world. Music to my ears and I'm sure to yours. Jana, the stage is yours. Can you unmute? Thank you. Yes, I can. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, and thank you, everyone in Interpret Europe for inviting me. I keep, I'm going to keep saying this afternoon or this evening because here in the tropical north of Australia and the southern hemisphere, we are headed into night. And indeed, we are leaving winter and heading into summer. So it's uh, quite the reverse of everything that I'm sure you're all experiencing. And we've just had our very first real weekend of summer and um, it's been fabulous. So uh, we're feeling very upbeat and happy here in the very northern part of Australia. The other advantage of living in a very remote location is that um, this COVID thing doesn't seem to have much of an interest in us. Um, so we have also been very, very fortunate. We are very much aware of how lucky we have been. So thank you again for this opportunity. I did come and speak to, to Interpret Europe in Croatia a few years ago. The advantage of all this wonderful online technology is I can join you um, even in a COVID era. And I can also join you with virtually no um, carbon footprint, which is excellent. But of course the disadvantage is that I'm not able to have attended or listened to many of the other presentations because while they're all online, you've mostly been having these really interesting discussions while I've been asleep. So <laughs> there's, there's pluses and minuses. But I'm going to share a screen and, and start the presentation. Um, just a few things I'd like to talk to you about. Hopefully. So you can see that, I hope. Yes, excellent. Okay, uh, Michael mentioned mindfulness. I started looking at mindfulness as a psychology PhD student uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, and so one of the things that I continue to explore is all the ways in which you can encourage people to be mindful. I teach at a university, so constantly trying to figure out ways to make my students be more mindful working with various agencies, trying to get them to be more mindful. So let's throw out a challenge for you and see if we can encourage a little bit of mindfulness in the audience here today, who can, of course, hide behind their screens by popping off to have a cup of tea and um, checking on the garden, etc. But let's throw out a challenge. The challenge is, and there are quite a few examples of them there, can you create a six word story? That's the first part of the challenge. Creating a six word story has become a bit of a thing on the internet and in various literary fiction circles. And what I want you to think about is a six word story that links what matters most about your place. And that could be the place that you live, the place that you love, the place that you interpret every working day, any of the places that you 
had um, experiences with him as a professional interpreter. So what is it about that place that's important that you can link to this broader issue of sustainability for the planet as a whole? And so it's a very, it's a, it's a tough one, this one. Can you come up with a six word story and can you make it link your place to this sustainability issue? So some of the examples here, I won't read through them. Some of them are from my students from a sustainability class. Some of them are from various internet competitions that were doing somewhat something similar, a six, six word story um, to warn us about what the future might be like if we don't start paying attention. So I'm particularly um, enthusiastic about the um, bottom two. Um, everyone gets five free international trips. I thought that that was subtle, but it gives a little bit of thinking. And then I really like the last one, that we need a sensible planetary dictator. So I'm going to leave that to you to try and think about during the presentation and feel free to put those in the chat if you've come up with a very um, clever one or even, even just a six word one. So hopefully that gets you thinking about what we're trying to um, achieve here. Now, I have a slightly simpler activity. I'm going to read you uh, a very brief synopsis of the oldest known written fairy tale. So this is not the oldest known fairy tale. I have discovered this wonderful world of linguists and archeologists who spend their lives studying the history of fairy tales, which I think would be a wonderful profession. I wish I had have known it existed earlier. This one is the first time we found a fairy tale in its written form in scrolls found in China, dating back more than 1200 years. And it's the story, oops, it's the story of Yi Shan. I'm gonna very give you a very brief synopsis of Yi Shan. And what I want you to do is think about, does this sound familiar? This is from roughly 600 AD in China. So Yixian's father Wu was the chieftain of a community of cave dwellers who lived long before the Han dynasty. As was the custom at the time, Wu had two wives. His first wife was Yixian's mother and she died when Yixian was just a baby. His second wife, Jin, also had a daughter, Jun Li. Jin and Jun Li were very jealous of their stepsister not just because of the attention Wu gave her, but because she was so beautiful, kind, gentle, and very talented. Sadly, one day Wu died and the family slipped into poverty. Jin, her evil stepmother, forced her into a life as a domestic slave, essentially cleaning and cooking and looking after her stepmother and her equally unloving and cruel stepsister. One day, Yi Xin befriended a beautiful fish in a lake near her home with golden eyes and golden scales. When her evil stepmother found out about this fish, she tripped him, caught him, killed him, and ate him. A slight twist on the tail that I think some of you are beginning to recognize. Yi Xian was devastated until the spirit of an old man appeared and told her to bury the bones of the fish in four pots and hide a pot under each corner of her bed and that her wishes would be granted if she talked to the bones. On the night of the New Year festival, when young maidens went to visit, uh, went to a big party in order to meet prospective husbands, which was uh, held by the local king, she really wanted to go, but her stepmother left her at home. So she made a wish to the bones and she found herself dressed in a beautiful gown of sea green silk and a pair of tiny golden slippers. And she was warned by the fish spirit not to lose even one of her slippers. A cut to the chase. She was frightened of discovery at the festival and she ran away, leaving behind one of her slippers. The king decided that if he could find the woman whose foot would fit such a beautiful slipper, he would make her his queen. I'm going to leave it there. The story gets a little, they have to go through quite a few trials and tribulations before they end up together. But in the end, indeed, they do. And the spirit of the fish um, is very happy with, with their work. 
I'm sure most of you by now would recognize this as Cinderella. Um, turns out Cinderella is one of three fairy tales that have existed in multiple cultures right across the planet for a very long time. So there is the hardworking, kind and honest stepchild or orphan who is mistreated but then rescued and rewarded for their hard work and kindness to others. There is the blacksmith and the devil who makes a deal with the devil in order to gain a special power or riches. And then depending on the country, he either has to pay a very high price um, for the devil's rewards or he tricks the devil. And that can be actually earliest traces of that can earliest versions of that can be traced back through Egypt to Nigeria. So as far as we know, the devil and the blacks, the blacksmith and the devil originated in the villages of Nigeria. And then we have a girl who marries a beast or an animal to save her father. And through kindness and self-sacrifice, it turns out he's actually a prince, Beauty and the Beast, or it's sometimes called the other animal bridegroom. And the earth, there are very early versions of that traced to Eastern Russia and to Japan. So some of these, what we are familiar with is very European fairy tales often have their origins in villages far, far away in a long distance time. So why do so many of these tales and each of these underlying stories has been remade into many other films and books and um, drama and performances, they recur constantly. Why? It's argued that it's because they actually teach values of importance, loyalty to parents, hard work, kindness to others, and that these are universal human values that all cultures consider to be important for members of that culture to engage in. And this work supports some work in neuroscience. We couldn't go as far away in terms of disciplinary background from our um, archeological linguists pouring through um, the hieroglyphics of, of the tombs in Egypt to find mention of the, the, the devil and the blacksmith to our medical scientists who are doing brain scans of people. But together what they tell us is that stories are hardwired into our brains. They're not just how we store important information, how we learn and communicate. They are also what binds us together in social groups and keeps our cultures alive. And it seems at the moment that stories may be the one thing that only humans have. We've been saying this for a long time, humans use tool and then tools and then we find out lots of others use tools. Humans communicate to hunt more effectively. It turns out lots of other animals hunt, communicate to hunt more effectively. Only humans can actually use language. Turns out lots of animals actually use language. But so far we've yet to find um, another member of the animal kingdom that has this storytelling ability. And that stories allow us to do two things. Allows you to imagine something you have not directly experienced. And that means you can learn much more information much faster, but also you can imagine a different future. So a story is how we imagine different futures. And we can only alter our futures if we can imagine them. So let's just very quickly go back to some very basics because lots of people use the word story, not so much in the world of interpretation, but outside of that. And they, and some interpreters, I think as well, sometimes see it um, in the French version of it as telling, giving a description of a set of events, of an event or a set of events. And that is a critical component to a story, but you need more than just a description of who went where and did what to whom. We need to know the reactions of characters to these events. What makes for a very powerful story is if the event is either unexpected or surprising or challenging, not necessarily a surprise, but quite challenging. But then we also need the decisions of our characters. What did they decide to do in response to these events? And then the consequences of those decisions. So to hear, you need all of those things to have a good story. Two other points I just want to make before I go on. 
Stories can be embedded in other stories and stories are often linked to story worlds. Now, the most classic commercial example of that is something like the Star Wars sets of films that Disney now um, has responsibility for. I say responsibility for, but may also just see them as a commercial product. So we have one story told across three films. And then we have another story that tells us how we got to the start of those three films. Now we have multiple stories for each of the characters in the original story. We are going to have movies about key events in the main story that seem to come out of nowhere. So they, I heard someone talking about how they, they have plans for another 49 Star Wars films in the next three or four years. That's um, an extraordinary story world, but story worlds exist uh, in very many other um, examples. The other thing is that stories have themes. And these are themes in the sort of sense that Sam Hamm talks about themes in his interpretive textbooks and his presentations. They're underlying lessons. They're a take home message from the story. It's what the story creator is hoping the audience will take away. And they are often linked to human values and cultural and political beliefs. So stories are important. Um, they're also everywhere. Some of them are hiding, hiding in plain sight. We just don't think about them as stories. When we think about stories, we tend to think about history. History is full of stories. Fiction, novels, drama, performances, film, television, games, both the simple ones of make-believe that children engage in and the more sophisticated ones through our mobile, augmented, virtual reality, permanently connected world in which you can play games with people anywhere, anytime in very complex ways. But they exist in all sorts of other places, even if we don't often call them stories. There is a a move in psychology, um, those psychologists that focus on your personal identity, your sense of self, and they are now very much studying aspects of what's called your life story. And it seems that the best way to define a sense of self is to say it's a life story. It's who you are as a consequence of your life story. And if you ask people to tell you their life story, they can usually do it with six to 10 smaller stories that explain to anyone else who they are. So they're very much using stories to understand personal identity. Very much the same, then we move up a level to cultural identity. For any of the other social groups or collectives that we're part of, we use stories to explain to our members and our non-members who we are, what we value, so values come in there, and what are our shared histories and our rules and norms? So how do you behave if you're a member of this collective? And that extends to our political identities and our professional identities. The assumptions and beliefs about what is and is not acceptable and the stories we tell about our everyday work life, who we make the villains, who we make the heroes in our everyday stories, is it always the, the administrators? Is it always the chief financial officer? Is it the people next who live in the building next door? They are all stories that build towards a professional identity. So I've had um, the opportunity to work both in interpretation and in tourism. So from working in both sides, there has been traditionally two very different stories from one side to the other. So let's have a look at what I think are the traditional stories that interpreters tend to have about tourism and that tourism providers tend to have about interpreters because they're two different stories. So the interpretation story. In the interpretation story, as a professional story, the interpreter is the narrator and the keeper of the story. So interpreters are the keepers of, and Michael sort of mentioned that in his introduction. And tourists are an audience for our stories. So interpreters are the ones who decide what the official story is, or they're the ones who know what all the stories are and they choose which ones and they are responsible for imparting that story to tourists as an audience. Their overall mission 
is to try and make the audience love the interpreted place as much as they do by sharing this official um, story, story world. The ongoing challenge is how do we get the resources we need to do this? And the constant fight against budget cuts and always being the last um, part of the decision-making process. Michael mentioned that too, the sort of build an interpretive center and then after it's done, ask an interpreter how they're going to use it. Um, is this how do we keep pushing forward the importance of these stories in our, in our institutions, in our world, but at the same time, many, are, many of us work in places where the more senior managers are hoping we will keep the place safe from harm. So uh, we're trying to make tourism work for us. We're trying to find that audience who will give us the resources. And then we're also going to try and use our stories to stop the tourists from doing harm. Sustainability is a place that we all might want to get to, but it seems very far away on a somewhat distant horizon. So let's skip over to the tourist story the tourist story from the perspective of both the tourists and the tourism providers because they're very closely linked. In this world, interpreters are a guide. Tourists want to create their own story. So interpreters are a guide to help them create their own story. The mission for our tourists and our tourism providers are also other support staff for them is to have an experience that will make a great story to share with others. And that's especially true in an increasingly social media world. The challenge for the tourists is how do they find that story in an unfamiliar place and make the connections that bring it alive. So they're trying to make interpreters work for them, but for a different purpose. And then sustainability as far as tourists are concerned, and a lot of tourism providers, despite the use of sustainability now being added to every other tourism document you might find, is mostly invisible in the tourist experience. And at best, it's a grumbly old ghost who keeps appearing every now and again, trying to make them feel bad. So I think we need a very, we need a new story of sustainability and tourism. And I actually think the best people to do that are interpreters. If we leave it to the tourism people to figure out a new story of sustainability, it's not going to happen. There may be individual exceptions to that rule, but I think there's nobody better to create a new story and tell that with um, passion and expertise than interpreters. So I put this picture up often. And I use it to identify two key groups in any audience. I can't really do that online. I know they're out there. But I put this up and I say, what do you think about this? What I typically get, and I suspect that, that it is existing in my audience today, is the people that very much agree with the headlines that went with this image when it went viral on new, online news media and social media, that most of the headlines were, you know, this, how distracted is this man? He he's, he's, can't even see the whale in front of him. Um, young man so uh, enamoured of his phone is missing out on real life. Um, the world is happening around him and he doesn't even care. So there are many people who will look at this image and go, oh, see, I told you, these phones, mobile device, devices, the world is going to hell in a handbasket because people aren't living in the real world, et cetera. But then when I show it to other people, there's another group who go, oh, wow, he's checking his phone to see if the photos came out and he's posting them to the internet so that someone will tell him what sort of whale it is. He's trying to find the local whale conservation group's webpage so he can put the details of the sighting on their whale sighting um, areas so that that can help conservation so they'll know more about whale migration in this area. He's sharing this with the world and talking about what an amazing experience it is. He's trying to find out how he can keep this whale safe in this um, marina. So there are some people that see it one way and then there are others who see it in a completely different way. And I want to use that example to su suggest 
part of the reason we need a new story of sustainability is not just because sustainability really is the challenge of our lives now, it's that we are interpreting in a very new world as well. And I think we have to be very careful of our assumptions and work on recognizing when we are judging before we are thinking. And I think we especially need to rethink our role in the online, always connected social media world. So on the one hand, we're very focused on our places and Michael threw out the challenge. So how do we connect our places, our locally to globally? Well, there is actually a tool that we have now that we're using right now that can make us, help us do that. But then we need an actual new story to tell. We've got new ways to tell it and new audiences to tell it to, but we need a new story. What makes for a good story? The first three, these are the sort of summary results of research um, in psychology, looking at the effectiveness of stories. The first three, not a surprise, I would think to anyone in this audience. We need authentic characters that are like us or that are likable. And in fact, if they're just likable, that's actually better. Like us is okay, but likable um, is better. We need to have plausible plots. We need emotion and suspense. But then the next three are increasingly being shown to be critical. We need to, the really powerful stories are linked to these universal themes. And we can argue about how many of them there are, but regardless of whose scheme, they come back to sort of four major categories, death and survival under threat, building and maintaining family and or relationships, heroism and altruism and standing against injustice. If we look back at the history of the discussions of the concept of sustainability, it's pretty much a story of all of those things, not automatically the family and relationships, except that many people would argue that sustainability is starting to mean something for them because they are concerned about what the future will be like for their family and their relationships. But a lot of it is about social inequities, the injustices that are embedded in our economic systems, the need to be more altruistic and care about the impacts of your behaviours for others, um, survival under threat from the consequences of, of our own poor decision making. So those universal themes almost immediately begin to give us a way to link a story of our specific place to a bigger story about sustainability. We need more active engagement. Our visitors need to be in the story. They need to be recreating the story, producing their own version of the story, and in such a way that they want to retell it, albeit maybe in a personalised, customised fashion, to others. And we also know that if you can embed a story in a story world and you can put it across multiple media, um, more people will be more mindful about it because you get this unexpected um, repetition of things. So in our new story of interpretation and tourism, as I head towards um, finishing up here, uh, we could have, an, there's been a move, a shift, I think, um, that interpreters are guides and coaches helping visitors to create new stories. I certainly think that there are people out there, interpreters out there doing that. But you're still working for tourism rather than with tourism. I actually think we need to recast um, ourselves as no longer being the guides or the narrators of the story. We are now the warriors in the story. And our job is to help tourists rethink their own lives to make them also warriors and how we're all going to fight together um, to try and address this issue of sustainability. So now everyone is working for the planet as a whole. And our mission becomes to give the tourists the experiences that they want, but an experience that encourages them to be mindful and to think about being sustainable beyond that holiday. The real challenge now, so we're going to come back to my six word story is finding that story in the interpreted place and making it work for all the different tourists that will come. 
And I think we can do that by having a story world rather than a single story. We need, we need to find multiple stories and we build them about those human values and universal story themes because we know back from our fairy tales, you, you connect it to one of those universal story themes and human values that matter and it will last through the ages and it will spread across the planet. And then we link those to the heritage themes, particularly the ones that are being discussed at the moment in, in Europe. Um, and that's that then we're, we're building that bridge between the local um, and the global. But before I fi finish, we need to be careful. Uh, we need to be very careful about whose personal and cultural values do we um, favour and who's being excluded or devalued. One of the challenges when you go into this online permanently connected world is you're now connected to so many more different people and you can make people mindful, but if you make them mindful and what they become aware of is that you don't care about their values, then the outcome will not be what you intend it to be. And if you don't, if you're not thinking uh, reflecting on your own values and who might you be excluding, then you run the risk of actually alienating people. There are multiple pathways to sustainability. We need to keep them all open. And the other area that um, is emerging in psychology, and I've been doing just a little bit of work, is this rising incidence. These labels are being thrown around, but they seem to be with more psychology research coming out into three often interrelated um, problems. Eco-anxiety, one of our tendencies in that, from the scientists um, when they talk about sustainability is they start telling us how bad it all is, how fast it is happening, how little time we have left to do anything about it. And that can create quite high levels of stress and anxiety. So it's not people, it's not that people are not acting because they don't believe the enormity or the seriousness of the problem is that we've made the problem so enormous and so serious they can't cope. Or they go into fatalism. I can't do anything about it. This is so serious, so big, so fast. What difference can I make? Or they're just tired of trying to figure out how to cope with it. So when we do tell our stories, they really need to be hopeful. They need to be about success. We need to have a little less of the doom and gloom and disaster and a little more of, um, you know, you can make a difference. You've already done it here at this site without realising it um, and so forth. We need positive stories, small wins, so that individuals feel like they really can do something about it. So if we go back to our first challenge, I can't see the chat. I will in a minute. So we'll see if anyone came up with a an answer to our, our six word story challenge. But the real question that I wanna leave you with is can you think how, even if you can't do it in six words, can you come up with different stories for the places that you interpret that link what matters about that place to this larger sustainability challenge? And I think the way we do that is we've got these heritage values, but they can be linked there, what is connected to the place, but we need to link them in stories to those universal human values. So I'm actually going to argue we need to go the other way. We need to think locally and act globally if we actually want to tackle sustainability. It's reversing the classic um, view of it. And that's me done. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Jana. That was great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, I, I said it would be dear to my heart and it absolutely was. I do love your final thought that don't spread fear, spread hope, which I'm sure we would all agree with. There was really only one question. There might be another one just come up now um, that came from Carol, which was about, is there only one origin of stories or did different civilizations, different groups of people come up with a similar story because we all have the same basic human values? 